All right. While I uh, while I get my uh, display here set up, we'll do our, our obligatory sound check. Make sure that our video guys can hear me, and you can hear me. So. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I wanted to push the slide sorter button. This is the filler, by the way, in case you're missing that. Um, where is the view? Oh, wrong application. You can't do slide presentation in Word. It doesn't work. Hot dog. He can be taught. So the first thing I have to tell you is I got my starting COBOL, and at least that started with the letter C. Uh, no. All right, that's, that's the worst joke of the day. My Challenge is, accepted. <laughs> oh, all right, and he's got like two hours later on. So anyway, uh, my talk today is going to be on the security operations, the SIM, and the security architecture use case development process. Um, I actually use this in work every day. I'm the director of the security operations team for Slate Consulting. We're an MSSP based in Virginia Beach. And we actually deploy an SO on our platform as an augmented tool because the commercial SIM that we use just doesn't do what the onion does. And this talk was originally put together. I just finished my graduate program with the Science Technology Institute. And this was like one of my capstone presentations. And I've got all the alphabet soup you could possibly want uh, to go along with that. Um, but as, as, as Phil mentioned, the Blue Team Handbook is not on this page because it didn't really contribute. A uh, book that I wrote four years ago, three years ago, uh, well received. Hopefully, uh, there's some people in the room, and if you have a copy and you have ideas for version three, I would love it, and I would love to be able to thank you as a contributor. So, what is my agenda? What are we going to talk about here today? Uh, I'm going to talk about the process of building a security operations use case and making that stand the test of time. So I want to tell you a story of why I actually thought this was a useful talk for a professional development conference and a, and a group of professionals. Um, many years ago, back in 2007, I was working for a Medicaid payer provider and we bought our first SIM. We spent $1.4 million. Put that bake in your noodle for a minute. $1.4 million. Four years later, we had implemented maybe 35 custom use cases, and we had maybe 30 data sources coming in, 28 of which were commercial data sources. And we had a falling out with the vendor, so we replaced it. At that time, I had 497 pages of actual use case documentation, okay? Yes, I like to write, as you know, um, but I didn't write for the sake of writing. I wrote because it has a lot of, a huge amount of value if you actually take the time to write down what your problem is, what your need is, what your requirement is, what kind of tooling you need to make it work, and what you're going to do with the output of the security platform, okay? I was audited out my nose being a Medicaid payer provider. We had, on average, 12 audits at a time. And when you're in, a, in a, this kind of an environment and you're dealing with federal funds, state funds, and the general public, and you have um, 5.7 lives under your under your purview, that's actually how the insurance industries measure it. They measure it with lives under their care. They don't measure it any other way. Uh, the auditors like to know how you monitor the environment. So we spent a lot of time with that. The specific <laughs> use case that I'm gonna kind of dig into, and I'm actually gonna show you some content from the next book where this use case is pretty much fully developed so you can see what one of these things looks like for real, is on account lifecycle monitoring and account lifecycle management. That may sound mundane, but it is by far the most audited topic that we ever had uh, when I was working for that. So I told you that to tell you this. When we replaced our $1.4 million SIM with a $400,000 SIM, next generation, phenomenal platform, really liked it. We gave Art, the guy from Canada, and Annie, the lady from Chicago, a ream of paper and we said, this is what we want you to do. They were actually capable in their SOW of implementing 33 <coughs> of my 35 use cases 
And after one year, because we had such a good set of use cases, we had 130 discrete data sources reporting into the SIM, all generating an appropriate level of alarm conditions. Meaning, since we had taken the time to write out what made a difference for us in monitoring account management, and we could most importantly, emphatically and with passion explain to every administrator of every one of the 268 information systems that we had, 143 of which had their own account management sub-functions, why we needed this, it was a whole lot easier. The vendor liked my use case model so much, they now use it internally with all their clients. And I, I ran into them at a Gartner conference and I said, are you guys still using that template? And they're like, oh yeah. So that's kind of nice. So when you think about where these things come from, you've got systems analysis and design. Um, is IT a complex system? Yes or no? Yes. How many information systems do your, does your business depend on? I don't know. But I do know this. There was a study done recently, uh, probably about three or four years ago. I wish I actually had the source. But the, the study talked about in the Fortune 1000, your typical user has 17 account username and passwords to memorize. That's pretty huge. How many do you have? You know, how many of you have bought, invested, and made a personal commitment to one password or something like that? Because if not, you're just going to go nuts or you're going to use the same password everywhere. And we all know the dangers of that. So as we go through this, a number of books actually uh, influenced this talk. And I do want to call your attention to a, a book I'm really fond of. It's called Pay to Think. It's a business book. And one of the things in the, in the Pay to Think we talk about is there's a chapter on being a learning organization. So that chapter was actually kind of influential because it really helped me to, to kind of put some of these thoughts together. So a, a use case embodies or brings forward a requirement. And I do like this feature of the Mac. I can show you my personal favorite on this chart is the one with the blue chair. <laughs> But as you look at this, yeah, this is a funny picture, and yes, it is very true. Um, I actually have some statistics on how many projects fail, you know, and you really have to be aware of that. You have to separate the need from the feature. And when you're working in the business of producing a use case and providing some instrumentation and assisting someone in doing and implementing a technical control that supports an administrative control, which means you're turning the wrench in the system so it tells you about a condition because you want to know if that condition is supporting and conforming to policy. That's what that sentence actually means. You really have to know what the need is, not the feature. The need is what you actually must do. So when we build use cases and when we build information systems and when we design a security process, and when we create a dashboard, and when we go turn on auditing in a system, and when we're going to go do something with the data, every single auditor asked me, what do you do with the alert? I, I never met an auditor that didn't ask that question. Uh, what we want to do is realize that we are building little mini software things. We are. If you look at the idea of building a dashboard, you may say, oh, that's cool, cool. I'll just look on Randy Franklin's site and I'll see the account lifecycle events and I'll make a dashboard of that. Three weeks later, okay, it will drive you nuts. Because when you really get right down to it, it's not just Windows. It's every other system you have that manages an account or a privileged entity or something like that. So requirements is the name of the game. And the use cases embody or bring forward and, and embolden those requirements. So I, I gave you a couple ideas of here of how projects fail. You can do research on your own to get these numbers of what projects fail and then how projects fail and things like that. But I can tell you this, $1.4 million, I had one guy monitoring the set. Guess who that was? Anybody want to guess? You. Correct. I had five other things to implement. I couldn't implement the SIM. 
37 real use cases later, 130 data sources later, one year, one vendor, $400,000, we had four people monitoring the SIM six by 12. Okay, that's pretty huge when you look at the fact that you articulated what you need, you understand the mission of the business, you understand the components of the value chain, you have instrumentation coming in from the things that make up the value chain, and you can actually bring them forward into monitoring consoles. Before we had this technology in place, we, uh, on an average quarter, we would re-image, um, you know, 30 to 40 systems and have anywhere from hundreds and hundreds of hours of downtime. Because we actually implemented better monitoring, we got down to a quarter, you know, you do these things, you compare one quarter from one year to one quarter for the next year. We went from, in, in the 40s, we went down to like five or seven re-imaging systems because we could detect better, we could respond better, we had better instrumentation. So that actually translates to FTE hours saved. FTE hours saved relates to who in the business? The wrench turner or the executive? It's not the wrench turner, the other guy. So often these things end up being little mini projects when you're building something in a complex system. You're building some kind of really cool thingamajig, whatever you're building in your security platform, your NSM platform, your SIM, what have you. Many moons ago, we used to talk in terms of the iron triangle from a project management perspective. That's changing and improving as things adapt and get better. So our iron triangle today is more looking at the value that we're receiving, um, <clears throat> the quality, and the constraints, as opposed to just the traditional triangle. So this is an example of as you decide and you make decisions when you implement something, when you build an architecture for something, think about how to get to a uh, something that is valuable in small incremental steps. I, I personally really believe the agile software development process is a great thing today. If you can release a component and you have nine features and you have nine capabilities, that's better than releasing, and you could release that in say one month. If you can release that in one month and those nine things are solid, that's better off than releasing 18 things in three months because you'll get immediate feedback people will be able to use the system and you'll get a chance to course correct. So that's an example of how our industry has improved. Use case is defined, right? Our use case itself, from a kind of a formal sense, is you know, the actions and steps that define what some, how someone interacts with a system. We call that someone an actor. They are external, they take data in, they provide data to, they receive data back, they're not actually turning the wrench, they're kind of your consumer, your input, your output, things like that. So that's our actor, and then our system is what's actually processing the data, how it's going through its various components. The gentleman who talked earlier, what he mentioned is that you know, he had bro scripts that actually made decisions for him and provided data to him, but the actors were the systems connecting that he never actually got attacked, the poor guy, right? that we're trying to, if he'd had systems attacking his environment, um, those would have been the actors. For security operations, again, we want to tune this formal computer science software architecture concept. We want to tune it to us as security people. So we want to look in that. We want to look about how um, we're achieving an objective. Usually that objective is to find the bad guy, find evil, find policy and procedure violation, and find human mistakes. Um, OnTrack Corporation, you guys, anybody here old enough to remember an MFM or an RLL five and a quarter inch drive? Does anybody want to admit that? <laughs> I actually threw away the receipt for my first hard drive about a year ago. It was a 30 megabyte full height five and a quarter and it cost $511 in 2000, or excuse me, in, in 1988 dollars. So it's like, and my wife was like, why are you still holding on to that? I'm like, do you know what this means? <laughs> anyway, in, in, that, in that package, you got a blue diskette from a company called OnTrack. They're still around. They've actually stopped producing that, as far as I can tell, their annual state of the nation on why you lose data 
because for, for like the past 20 years, more than half of the data loss has caused from human error. People make mistakes. They do. My favorite mistake that I caught, because we had a, a great sim, was, um, and probably none of you have had this story as I tell you the story. We had a, a, a gentleman who stood up a new H323 server. That's uh, some VoIP telephony thingy, technical term thingy, made that up for you guys, uh, in the DMZ for video and voice conferencing. And he had the bright idea that since he already had an IP address assigned with firewall rules that he should reuse that. What he did not realize is that his secure shell port was exposed. And you know, since it was a requirement, it's because we had built a use case and a logging policy that if you deployed a system in production, you could not actually get your address and get, uh, get connected to the network until you'd set it up to log to our SIM because we actually had that in place. Within four hours, we got 383,000 password guessing attempts <laughs> and one success. <laughs> and I went to his office and I said, dude, what are you doing? I'm standing at the 323 box. I said, no, you're giving it away to China. <laughs> it's like, no, I'm not. I said, yes, you are. You know, and, and, and the evil of that is the guy didn't know what he made a mistake. Okay, so these, con these fancy cool capabilities we're talking about and the idea of actually developing these things will catch human error. And you know, the science tells us that it's not just the bad guy, it's the good meaning intended person who made a boo-boo. We have another great use case we had where we had a, a, a software development project that went awry. And since we actually had monitoring for our file systems came in from a package called Veronis to let you know the number of changes and such, somebody had deployed code in production but not changed the name of the reference system that was dev. That ever happened to anybody? <laughs> okay, not as big a laugh as the last one, but you know, so he gets rid of 172 gigabytes of production data. We knew about it within 10 minutes because we came in and the monitoring program says, such and such is way out of spec for the number of file system changes they had. Hey, uh, Joey, that's not his name, you were way out of spec yesterday, what's going on? And then they figured it out, but they you know, rec recovered the data, brought it back, but we had a monitoring control. So you, know, you have to have a cool complex picture. I chose to have bigger words so they'd be easier in the room. Um, what's your business need? What is the security question that must be answered when you build a use case? If you're not answering a security question, you're not building a security architecture use case, you're doing something else, or there may be some other use case rules that can apply to help you. You develop your requirement list, and remember, we want to articulate a need, which is different than a want, which is different than a feature. What do you actually have to do? Because if you instrument something and you can identify the need, you can satisfy that need, you can actually say, we got it done, you know? Um, I'm a big fan of closure. I think it's one of the most important things in a project. How many of you are, worked on a project and never gotten closure? Oh yeah, I hear, I hear one oh yeah. That means there's one honest person in the room. <laughs> now there's a lot of guidance to help you here. A, a, a plethora, that's the second definition, look up the word. The first definition is a sack on the skin. People use that word wrong. Uh, so if you look and you see, you've got the common internet security controls, the CIS top 20, you've got the Australian Signals Directorate, which I learned about from uh, Ismail was here in the last fall, really interesting set of standards. You've got NIST 853, which is a program you, you conform to by the pound. It is a 494 page document, last time I looked at it. But these things all influence your requirements, and that means you're then gonna go influence your data stream and your system and your end capability. So when you actually construct one of these things, you need to follow a template. I'll actually show you one in a few minutes. Um, uh, my template is about three pages long with all the text and the things to prompt me. Word document, big fan of that. Doesn't have to be super complex. The name. The purpose, 
what are the requirement statements, and you'll see on the right-hand side things that are germane or that relate to the security monitoring function. So again, we're taking a traditional approach and we're applying it to our knowledge domain. We also have something unique as security people. We do want to try to see if the use case and the monitoring and how it relates to the kill chain because if we can understand at what point we're instrumenting something in the kill chain, and if you're at the point where you're acting on objectives in the kill chain, that's kind of like game over. They've already gotten in and they've owned the house. The better off you can push something or do something earlier in the kill chain, the better off you are. So that is actually a very helpful thing for our, our cathartic thought process. Use cases have a place in the library. Use cases need to be scoped appropriately. You do not want to build a use case that says monitor account lifecycle. That is an epic failure. You want to build an individual use case that says monitor changes to elevated groups. That's a lot more achievable. A use case that says monitor accounts not used and created or not used for five days and they've been created. You want to build a use case that says Monitor for this accounts being disabled within one hour of the termination notice. That was the second most audited thing we ever dealt with in our environment. Not only did the auditors want to know how we manage our accounts and all of our systems, they wanted to see concrete proof where we knew that accounts had been disabled correctly. And because we could articulate it and explain it and we had instrumentation and we had the most important thing, the time of the request and the time of the action, we actually could build this nice chart. And what we found, because we put some thought process in it, in it was 97.2% of all accounts were terminated within 83 minutes of the notice. I just gave you two very important parts of a, of, of a security conversation, a measurable metric we're taking this concept of, of monitoring account management, et cetera, and what is our metric? What percentage of success do you have and what is the duration? And is the duration within the acceptable time limit? So if you can actually derive, derive, not drive, that during your requirements analysis process and your requirement development process and you know the purpose of the use case that you're gonna instrument and what you actually want to get out of it, you will actually solve a problem, which gets back to probably everything that I just, you know, because I know what I'm going to talk about. Um, is that example ambiguous? The idea of knowing when accounts get terminated within a two hour time frame. Is there any ambiguity in that sentence? No. Is it real? Do I care about firewall rules in that? No. Firewall rules are out of scope. Antivirus, out of scope. Guess what that does for me? That lets me actually be successful because I can articulate a problem, build a monitoring functionality, get to an end state, put that one to bed. What that does for me is that actually gives me a mechanism by which I can test these things in my environment. Design of experiments is actually pretty huge when you deal with complex systems. The better off you design an experiment, the better off you can find things in your design specifications. If you've not seen this acronym before, it is, it is a business acronym, we use it all the time. Make sure that as you're going through this process, you wanna be smart about what you do. Specific, the more specific you are, the better chance you actually have of arriving at the other side and getting it done. If you make it broad in general, you kinda of go all over the map. Determine what the measurements are. Um, I will also tell you, that one of the challenges I faced in the 25 years that I've been in IT, actually I think it's more than that, I had a birthday last month, um, it's probably 26 years now, is metrics. Any, who loves metrics? Is, is there a metric fan in the room? I got, I got two volunteers. I didn't, I'm legally blind, so if some of you waved, I didn't see that. So, you know, I got, I, all I saw was two guys were fonds. How many people in this room, 140? So that means 138 are not metric happy. Well, I'm telling you, they take a little longer, right? But if we can actually produce metrics, guess what we actually have? 
measurements for our security program. The better we can measure ourselves as to how well we are protecting the business, the better we can articulate to who begins with the exec and ends with TIV about what we're doing to protect their business, the better off we are and the more funding we get. Were you gonna? You're good. You're good. Money. Money. I mean, really, you know. Uh, realistic, time-based. I think these things are self-evident, right? So we have a very particular actor in this in the security architecture use case model. Our actor is the SOC. Our actor is the person at the other end of the notification and what they're going to do with the data. We want to be able to put information in the hands of the SOC so that they can actually do something with it and provide them with guidance. Do you create a ticket? Do you reach out? Do you talk to the manager? Probably not. At what point do you actually involve HR if a person isn't termed on, if they're, if they're getting at the termination notice? All these various things. They lead to conversations, but ultimately, when you build a use case, you want to think about the end consumer of that use case and along the way figure out how you're going to instrument them to do their job effectively. We have components when we build use cases. I am a big fan of actually articulating in a use case document in every one of the, of the 37 I mentioned earlier at how many pages total? 497 because I spent four years developing them, by the way. I didn't just do this overnight. Um, actually names all of the components in the platform. The McAfee antivirus CPO system is at IP address so-and-so and user account so-and-so, and this is the table. Because when I need to go change it, when someone broke it, and when someone at the other end of my SIM platform or my, secure, or my NSM platform changed something, and they didn't tell me how do I go talk to them about what they will use a polite term broke? Okay, how many of you have lived that lesson where you built something in year one, somebody changed it at the beginning of year two, and your stuff doesn't work? Has anybody experienced that pain in the room? I saw once, I, one, one courageous soul waving their hand in the back, right? Um, but that's why we take the time to write this stuff down. You know, it, it does make a difference because you want to know how these things work. You also really want to know if your monitoring isn't working, where did it break? These things are very complex. You know, building these things into SIM platforms and NSM platforms and all the sensors you need and the rule sets and, and, and disk space, you know, every, anybody ever run out of disk space? That's kind of important too, right? Also, a lot of these platforms tell us things that are not inherently obvious. Does anybody in the room own a Palo Alto next generation firewall? Uh, well again, one, two brave souls. Now, if you're instrumenting your Palo Alto firewall and you want to provide that to your SIM or your SOC or your NSM platform, um, how many times have you had to explain to people what the word alert means in a rule? It does not mean the Palo Alto is giving you an alert. It means the, administ the firewall admin told the NGFW, you must turn this feature on to write it to out so we actually get a result. So reference data makes a difference. When you look at use cases for account lifecycle events, you look at the data process, what occurs in what order, you actually draw a picture, there are a lot of moving parts. And for the SIM, SOC, security architecture, NSM world, it is well worth it to write out the moving parts and to draw a picture. There's actually a very, very nice illustration on the Second Onion site. If you haven't looked at it, you should. It's the, somebody created a nice architecture diagram and it tells you where all the stuff flows through the system. Very, very nice tool. But for us, for account management, account lifecycle management, you actually have to turn on the policy. You actually have to get the Windows log. You actually have to go get the data from Windows. How many ways can you actually get data from Windows? There's at least five that I can think of right now. You have to send it in. You got some TCP communications. You got some latency. You're going to have to fight with your Windows admins who don't want you to be pulling data every two minutes. They want you to pull it once a day. That does not meet an objective if you pull security data from a platform once a day because what is affected? Your time to detect and your time to respond. 
you know that because as you write out the use case and you write out the requirement and you come up with a measurable target and that gives you as the security professional the ability to engage with a particular system administrator on paper to explain this is why we need your help to implement this function for our security program so we can do effective monitoring. So what does it look like? I, I put in a couple of screenshots in here so we could see what some of this stuff actually looks like. We actually have auditing turned on. You can actually see this data. For every system, you have to make sure that the system is, in fact, instrumented. Uh, you have to turn on various policies. Um, in one commercial SIM platform, I just grabbed this as an example. Uh, you, know, you look at the name of the rule. Yes, they spell behavior wrong. I didn't do that some various thresholds, the unique pieces of information they're looking for in their platform, um, a panel to bring things to your attention. There's enough information here in an alert panel or a dashboard. Something suspicious happened. Um, failure to log on to a disabled account and it's red. Is red good? No, red's bad. <laughs> Once you have the basics implemented, you can do something more sophisticated. This is a more sophisticated example where you have an account that's created and then is this deleted? Account created and deleted, right? Yeah, created and deleted within a very short amount of time. Is that suspicious? Oh yeah. Do you want to know about that? Oh yeah. What kind of evil happens when that happens? I don't know. <laughs> um, for the onion, right, we've got all the data. It may not be as easy to get, but you've got it. You, know, you can go ahead and search for it, you can find it, this happens to use the event to syslog mechanism to get it into the onion. We can actually go get it. Uh, either I tried four methods. By far, this was the easiest and least painful. Um, and yes, I did try the OSEC agent, but I, it, you know, just kind of drove me nuts. But it worked, and I could get it. And from there, you know, are you actually getting data? We mentioned earlier you want to know if your system is working as part of the tooling for your SOC function or your SIM function. Tell them, look at the dashboard once a day. Make sure you're getting data at some volume so that you know your monitoring control works. And then you look at it and you say, hey, we've got dashboards too. These happen to be four event IDs that you can't read them, I'm sorry. There's little numbers over there. So yes, you can actually see the account lifecycle event. So you know, even here, we can actually go create these types of things based on the event ID numbers and you know what that looks like. So you can find these things. There's dozens and dozens of other use cases you can actually create. And what I wanted to do was to show you a bit on what these things actually look like. You know, if you're going to go, if you're going to go talk about these things um, and build this stuff out. This is in the next book, by the way. So this is kind of like a an author preview. Um, this is the the template, a purpose statement. A problem statement, I have prompts in here. Describe the, the business objective problem that the use case will address. That happens to be in my, in my square brackets. And then I have guidance on what you want to do in actually developing one of these use cases. So as you go and do this in your environment, you take a template, you put prompts in yourself so that in the, in there for yourself so that you actually build this kind of stuff out correctly. And you are building things and you're being consistent. What are the discrete objectives? I personally, in my template, I have the SMART acronym. I put it in my template so I can pick the things out that I want to do and give myself a self-check. Um, I look at what am I actually going to communicate to my security operations center on the other end? What's the rule? How do they go look for it? What are they going to do with it? That's very important. All of the various component names. Um, if you've ever been in a business where you've managed a SIM platform over time, or an NSM platform over time. Uh, how many of you only have like one or two thing reporting to the platform? Is that common? No. How many of you have more than 25 things reporting to your platform that's under your care? Anybody wanna, I see many, many hands up. More than 100, uh, my personal height was 130. And I, you know, which is, amazing to me, but it was. And I, we did actually see some hands at more than 100 for those of you just not turning around. So you've got you know, your kill chain components, where does this actually work? So we'll, I'll actually show you what, um, what some of this stuff looks like. And you know, 
There's a lot of value in this um, deliverable profile section. We actually, for every single business document that IT produced where I work, and we do this today where I work now, we have this profile, name, requirement, sign off date, what it relates to, what its revision number is, what its effective date is. Because when an auditor comes in and they want to evaluate what you're doing to manage security or monitor security on behalf of your organization, they're looking for the idea that you've done some risk analysis, you've, done, you've produced an instrumentation or to support dealing with risk in your environment, and that you have a way of knowing how these things work. We're actually going through a SOC 2 right now, and they're asking us these types of questions. It's very interesting. So I have an example for you here. I realize, of course, this is a lot, a lot, of, a lot of words, but what we're saying is we really want to know elevated access in Windows has to do with group management and group membership of what's actually going on. So I have my fact that I want to know the answer to this specific point. We want to be able to achieve monitoring for 100% of all changes to elevated groups in our environment. How many elevated in groups are there in a Windows Active Directory domain by default? Do you actually know? Does anyone know? 14. Correct. There are 14, which means I have to find a data owner for up to 14 groups. Usually it's going to be two or three data owners because it's the domain, but there in fact are 14 elevated groups, and all those groups provide very specific um, rights in, pro in the capability. Uh, my requirements, I have to make sure that I get a success notification to a group owner. Okay, so think about this. If you have groups that are used in the file system or an application, and those groups grant elevated rights in a system. Who is the person in your business that needs to know if someone has been granted access or had access removed from their application? It's the data owner. If you had 100 applications in your environment, how many of you think you could actually go find up to 100 data owners? Is it easy? Is it an easy problem? It is not an easy problem. But by going back and explaining to a potential data owner that this is part of our monitoring control program, because we've written a good use case that explains it and ties it to company policy, and then we know that we're going to be audited and we can articulate that to someone, it makes that conversation easier. So I actually created a nice little picture here. I don't think I have all 14 groups. I've only got like 11 of them. Uh, the, is there something missing? Is there a convention? Are users who change these groups known? And when you start decomposing this, what you really get down to is you find lots of things when you're monitoring account management. You find this idea that people will create accounts in their constituent system or their application that do not conform to the directory standard. Is that a problem? Yes. That is a problem. By actually instrumenting this use case, you will detect that problem. And now what, what have you got? You have another thing to solve. It's outside the scope of this use case. You have a new use case you're going to develop. You, the, the secondary use case you would, you would build is monitor for account creation and deletion that is not in the reference directory. We actually did that because we would import the list of active accounts in the platform once an hour. Very easy active directory query. There's about, probably, if there's more than 100 people in this room, there's at least 50 ways of doing it to get the answer to that question. Put it in the directory, an account uh, activity occurs, check the account activity against the reference list, you have an exception. I mean, it's, and it's a natural outgrowth of creating one use case you have another one, and you have a lot of the source material that you need to actually create this process. You also find that uh, you, you may have naming convention issues. Certain accounts are permitted to and not permitted to make changes. 
certain accounts are permitted and not permitted to be added to elevated groups. If you had a process in your organization where you separate out users who have elevated access and you give them a specific account and you find someone is adding accounts that don't conform to that naming convention to the elevated access group, what have you found? A serious problem. How many of you have ever dealt with users who have to be in the administrators group on their local workstation? Okay, I can tell. Instructor Cam says, lots of faces said, oh my God, I can't believe you brought that up. Have to be. Have to be. You know, well guess what? We, we actually did this. Um, we had 4,500 employees. We found 1,168 employees who had their accounts in the administrators group. That's 22%. Guess what I just gave you? Begins with metric and ends, begins with measurable. It also means I can institute a change, which I can track and show value. It also means I can go find out what that problem causes. Inappropriate software installation, not conforming to policy, and a huge amount of risk. My favorite case was the, uh, was the business director in Georgia. I'm sorry, <coughs> she was in Georgia. And she generated 83 antivirus alerts in one minute because she read soccer mail. I don't know what soccer mail is, but she compromised her entire section because re she was reading home email on the company network and a whole office is just kaputsky. That's a technical term. Kaputsky. <laughs> a little multiculturalism for you there. Um, going on. That made this, this uh, you know, administrative account business very nice and monitored. So we could actually do all that. And long story short, we got down to less than 600 people who had a secondary account. And we got down to a very, very low rate of people who had their login account in the admin group. But because we actually had these models and these capabilities, and these ability to pull this data in and do something with it and tie it to a program and an audit control. And most importantly, we knew why the user needed this and we gave them a, a nine page document with 17 compensation mechanisms of how they could get software to work with their standard account. Modify this, go do this. And we, we taught our service desk. We actually made that problem pretty much almost go away. We ended up with uh, eight tax people. And if you've ever interacted with tax people, they're very conservative. So we thought our risk was pretty low. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for your time. That's my talk on the security operations use case.